before I went to medical school, I actually worked in Washington, D.C. for a congressman, and I worked on their science and technology policy, as well as maternal and child health issues. So I learned that we really needed more women and more minority physicians who understood how policy and legislation impacted health care. And at that time, I'll fast forward, I was a practicing physician before entering industry. And I was a researcher in practice for women's health studies. And then I joined the clinical research industry almost 20 years ago. Welcome to Science with a Twist, a podcast for curious people who enjoy exploring how science impacts our daily lives. From technology that helps the fight against COVID-19 to solutions that help clean the water we drink is all thanks to science. In each episode, members of Thermo Fisher's scientific team talk to experts who are on the cutting edge of redefining how we exist. Let's get started. Hello, and welcome back to Science with a Twist, brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific, the world leader in serving science. I'm your host, Terry Summers. Today, I'll be joined by Dr. Rose Blackburn, VP and Global Head of General Medicine and Women's Health, Medical Science and Strategy for the PPD Clinical Research Business at Thermo Fisher. Dr. Blackburn is globally recognized as a world leader in women's health product development, and today's conversation will focus on a very timely issue. Why improving clinical trial representation for women and other underrepresented groups is critical for achieving health equity. The importance of diversity in clinical trials might seem obvious. For one, medicines are not equally effective for everyone. Additionally, the same condition might present in a completely different way from one person to the next. For example, with heart disease, women are more likely to experience less common symptoms like back pain or indigestion. These symptoms can sometimes be in the absence of chest discomfort. Given these differences, it might surprise you to learn that it wasn't federal law for women to be included in clinical trials until 1993. Before then, it was NIH policy, but it wasn't law. The change in law helped. Now, NIH-funded studies must also determine if a treatment could potentially impact males, females, or minority groups differently. However, gaps in clinical research persist. Despite making up 50% of the population, women only make up an average 41.2% of clinical trial participants. For women from underrepresented racial ethnic minority groups, the numbers are even more startling. In 2020, only 11% of clinical trial participants were Hispanic, 8% were Black, and 6% were Asian. While simply recruiting more women for clinical trials seems like an easy fix, the issues at hand are far more complex. Today's guest, Dr. Rose Blackburn, is a leading voice when it comes to the importance of clinical trial diversity to improve health equity. She's passionate about achieving greater representation for women and other underrepresented groups in research. Since 2016, Dr. Blackburn has served on the FDA Patient Engagement Advisory Committee, which is part of the FDA's patient-focused drug development initiatives. In that role, she provides advice on issues relating to the regulation of medical devices and their use by patients. She also helps with the development of the agency's guidance and policies. Welcome, Dr. Blackburn. Thank you so much for joining us today. I'm excited about this discussion. Hey, and thank you, Terry. Great introduction and great way to frame up this really timely topic. So I'm really happy and excited to be here today. Okay, to start off, can you share a bit about your career journey and your decision to focus on women's health and what originally piqued your interest in health policy? Sure. Initially, I really liked the variety of surgery, preventive care, and taking women across the continuum of care as an OBGYN specialist. Also, at that time, in the beginning of my training, the other reason I chose obstetrics and gynecology was that there were so many women role models in that specialty, from residents, attendings, up until leadership of the department. There were a lot of great role models there. Before I went to medical school, I actually worked in Washington, D.C. for a congressman, and I worked on their science and technology policy, as well as maternal and child health issues. 
So I learned that we really needed more women and more minority physicians who understood how policy and legislation impacted healthcare. And at that time, I'll fast forward, I was a practicing physician before entering industry. And I was a researcher in practice for women's health studies. And then I joined the clinical research industry almost 20 years ago. That's interesting about your experience working with a congressman. That gave you an inside view on how to get things done, right? It really did. For our audience today, let's clarify an important definition for this discussion. How would you define women's health and does women's health expand beyond just gender specific conditions? That's a great question. And the answer is it depends. It depends on the context. In clinical research, a lot of times it is focused, women's health is focused on reproductive health or obstetric and gynecological conditions. In the broader sense, and what's interesting is that a lot of diseases predominantly affect women. For example, autoimmune diseases such as rheumatoid arthritis and lupus, 80% of those patients are women. Two thirds of migraine sufferers are women. Similarly, most Alzheimer's patients are women. So there are diseases other than reproductive conditions that affect women a lot that aren't always considered women's health. And we're broadening that definition and focus across industry. Great. In the opening, I mentioned the 1993 law mandating the inclusion of women in clinical trials. Can you give our audience some background or the history on the non-inclusion of women and other underrepresented groups? How did that happen and go on until 1993? Sure. There were legitimate concerns about including women of childbearing age due, some, due to some drug-related incidents and side effects. Um, so in 1977, an FDA policy recommended excluding all women of childbearing potential from phase one and early phase two drug trials, meaning the first in human and the, the, the stage of trials right after that. Um, so that there were thousands of women that took certain medications and they gave birth to children with birth defects. Um, so there was a legitimate concern and this caused researchers to adopt a very cautious approach to females of all ages participating in clinical trials. Um, and then for decades, women were excluded from drug trials due to another false belief that hormone cycles would skew test results. Um, so there were a lot of different beliefs about women participating, but it was based on some legitimate findings of um, some medications causing birth defects. And, and it, it, again, it's legitimate. So just men and women are, have physiological differences. So drugs have to be studied in men as well as women, especially if men and women are both going to take a specific medication. Similarly, right. is there are physiological differences between children and adults, between very elderly adults and um, non-elderly adults, and even between non-pregnant and pregnant women. So there are physio physiologic, biological differences in how different groups metabolize medications. And that's also found across some some drugs and some ethnic groups metabolize drugs differently. So we know scientifically that there are differences and therefore there needs to be testing and trials in all different populations. Can you please touch on some of the recent advances in clinical research that have helped the healthcare industry learn about how certain conditions impact populations differently? And maybe you have some specific examples you could share? One great example is that women and men may experience symptoms differently for different conditions. Take heart disease. Uh, men, and most of the clinical research um, until very recently has been conducted on largely male-dominated studies. Men are found to present differently for, for heart attacks and heart disease. They may present with the classic symptoms of crushing chest pain, difficulty breathing, tingling in the arm, uh, whereas women's uh, pre presenting symptoms are a little more subtle. It may be more indigestion or pain in the chest that's less marked. A lot of times women may present but their symptoms don't meet the classic 
definition of what a heart attack looks like and their care may be delayed. Similarly, the way people exp experience pain can be ex uh, perceived differently. And then that also introduces an element of bias in how patients are treated. Sometimes pain and symptoms are dismissed in different populations and people get a delay in care and also this can lead to different outcomes for patients. Just to take a step back, clinical trials and clinical research leads to the approval of products for general use. So our work at Thermo Fisher we're involved and we've been involved in pivotal studies for products that treat vaginal infections. And one of those products was recently approved within the last three years or so. Another way we've been involved is in some of the COVID vaccine trials. We were very instrumental in assuring that the, the trials for COVID vaccines met the required diversity proportions for women and other minority groups. We also are very excited that Thermo Fisher just has had a preeclampsia test pr approved, which is the first one. And preeclampsia is a condition for in pregnant women. It's a hypertensive complication. And for 30 years, there was no diagnostic test, even going back to when I was in medical school and training. So this is a huge advancement in how to diagnose early preeclampsia, and it's important because it's a huge source of maternal mortality as well as maternal morbidity. What factors contribute to challenges in recruiting and retaining women and other minority groups for clinical trials? If you think about how busy we are as women and think about now participating in a trial, which requires sometimes several visits beyond your usual doctor's appointment. So you commit to a trial and it impacts your day-to-day -day life. One of the reasons it's difficult sometimes for women is the, just the logistics of getting to, a, to an appointment. Women have many roles. So they take care of themselves, they take care of their families, they may take care of the elderly re relatives. So if you think of all the different roles women play, and then superimpose being in a trial, it can be difficult. And that's the same for a lot of groups, not just women. One of the things that helps um, relieve some of the burden of trial participation, and we've developed a lot of these offerings, are really thinking about how to make trials more accessible. How do we set up so that appointments for visits are outside of normal business hours, early morning, late evening, weekend visits. Also, how many procedures or visits can be conducted using telemedicine? We're all using more telemedicine now for our regular medical care. This can be also adapted for clinical trials. Do lab tests and other procedures need to be done in an office setting? Uh, not all the time. So we can we have the capacity to send visiting nurses out to patients to do blood draws and also to assist with medication administration. So all of these tools can be deployed to relieve the burden of patients having to drive across town or drive to a different city to participate in a clinical trial. Uh, the other thing for women, and again, not just for women, but for families, providing childcare and parking reimbursement just to make their visits also is helpful and relieves a bit of this logistical burden of making a, an appointment and being seen and participate in a trial. That's great. Those sound like great advancements. Little things that mean a, make a huge difference. It's a big difference. The issue of women's health and the lack of an investment in it that we're talking about today has been in the news recently. To give the audience a quick summary, in March, President Biden signed an executive order on advancing women's health research and innovation. Its aim is to jumpstart funding and encourage research in the U.S. and globally. I think it's important to note that women's health accounted for only 2% of the $41.2 billion of venture capital investment in 2023, according to a Deloitte analysis. Through the White House Initiative on Women's Research, launched in 2023, the Biden administration has committed over $300 million in funding, $100 million through the Advanced Research Projects Agency for Health Sprint for Women's Health Initiative. That's a mouthful. Additionally, the National Institutes of Health pledged $200 million to close gaps in women's health research starting in fiscal year 2025. 
The new executive order is said to expand the financial commitment and spotlight women's health by calling on Congress to commit $12 billion in funding new women's health research across federal agencies over time. Of course, there's no guarantee Congress will approve any bit of the request of $12 billion. However, there is some good related news. A bipartisan group of female senators introduced legislation on May 7th that would make $275 million available for menopause research and awareness over five years. Dr. Blackburn, can you help us uh, put all of this into perspective? And do you think we'll see this investment and is it enough or do we need to go further? No, it, it, it's exciting and we need to commend the initiative. It's a start and it underscores the need for public and private partnerships because the government clearly can't do it all. I think the other great thing about these initiatives and these promises, it, a lot of it's already starting. There are grants in progress for women's health research that's already it's not down the line, it's happening now. And it's the other great thing about this is that it's stimulating a lot of interest in conversation. By announcing this from the government, it sparked public interest and awareness that this is happening. No one knew of these disparities in women's health research funding before. It wasn't widely known. Now it is, and that's sparking a lot of interest as well as investment. And these public-private partnerships are very key. Great. That's great news. Are there any conditions that you think particularly need to be prioritized in women's health research? Yeah, menopause and menopause related uh, conditions such as osteoporosis is going to be huge because there's in all countries and regions, there's a huge growing elderly population. And we know here in the U.S. there's a not only a growing elderly population, but people are working to older ages. So menopause in the workplace has become a, a big discussion and a big challenge sometimes in, in figuring out ways to support women in the workplace with these conditions. The other thing is maternal health, especially preeclampsia. So it's very exciting that Thermo Fisher has the preeclampsia test because there's still poor birth outcomes in maternal health in the U.S. I think there's a lot more attention that's going to be paid to improving birth outcomes. And then there's a significant interest in funding around autoimmune diseases because, as I mentioned earlier, autoimmune diseases preponderantly affect women. So 80% of people with an autoimmune disease are, are, are going to be women. So there's going to be a lot of interest in that area. Dr. Blackburn, if you could leave stakeholders with a specific call to action for women's health, what would it be? There are a few things. I think there's a need to continue to focus and prioritize funding for women's health research, such as some of the uh, government funding initiatives that we just discussed. There also needs to be a focus on developing the next generation of researchers that focus on women's health. So building a pipeline of women and girls in STEM is critical. And then making sure we're mentoring women in organizations, whether it's government, research organization, private organizations, so that we have a pipeline of women in leadership to push these initiatives forward. And then lastly, continue to support companies and companies, small companies, that are founded by women researchers that are focusing on women's health, focusing on developing and supporting the whole continuum of companies and organizations that are focused on women's health research is key. Great calls to action. Dr. Blackburn, thank you so much for joining us today. This has been an enlightening, informative conversation, and I really appreciate your expertise on this important topic. Thanks for tuning in to this episode of Science with a Twist. This show is brought to you by Thermo Fisher Scientific, the world leader in serving science. If you enjoyed this episode, then follow Science with a Twist wherever you get your favorite podcasts.